let's, uh, let's get started. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Dmitry Vinik, and today we will talk about stress. It's not about stress testing, so if you're here for the stress testing, you won't see it here. It's more about stress testing you at work and uh, in your regular life. So that's basically what this talk is about. And to be more clear, what it actually is about is the, it's important to establish the goals. And the goals are fairly simple, but still very valuable. And the first and foremost, we'll try to understand what the stress is and the importance of it. Then we'll discuss how to deal with it, how to deal with stress in the first place. What are the practices? And more importantly, how do we move forward? Because often you learn something at a conference talk and then you just uh, get back to your regular um, things that you do. So it's important to figure out the ways to establish the better approach and actually stick to it. So, stress. Why should we even talk about it? If we were to look externally, and it's very easy, to, it's much easier to look externally first rather than internally. And when it comes to external uh, stressors, this already infamous a uh, fairly old letter by now, from 2004, from an uh, EA spouse. Basically, it's about, um, it's from basically written from a wife of the electronic arts employee uh, who's been, you know, game, gaming industry is famous for having very long hours. And uh, here she basically described and illustrated in a quite graphic details of how the stress affects their regular life, not just the professional careers. More, like, more recent case, of course, is the Telltale, if you've heard of the company that basically made games like Walking Dead or Wolf Among Us, it's basically, uh, they laid off majority of their stuff. I believe by now, all uh, the entire stuff. And, you know, Brandon made a, good ma made a good point that it's important to take care of yourself. The work is just work, and we have to remember that. And that basically was the main point that uh, he tried to highlight, and that's where I will be, will be highlighting throughout today's presentation. So... There are a lot more cases out there, externally, of course, but it's important to look internally as well. When it comes to your colleagues, to your family or yourself, you have to evaluate and examine what kind of stressors we face on a daily basis. And if I were to speak personally, I was, it was basically in my 20s. I, uh, I was going through the immigration process when I was immigrating to Canada. I've been studying full-time, I've been working full-time, excessively, I would say. And as a result, at one point, in fall 2015, it was a bizarre evening. I was basically preparing my dinner, but then at some point I felt like numbness in my left hand. It was weird, but I was like, okay, it's fine, maybe I slept on the left hand, it's, it's okay. Let's just brush it off. Then I felt numbness in my right leg. All of a sudden, doesn't really happen often. And at that point, I'm like, okay, the first thing I have to do is turn off the stove, because I was preparing the dinner, because that's what you think about, food. Um, then, basically, the leg came back to normal, and then at some point, my entire left side of the body went numb. It wasn't a pleasant experience. I basically had to ultimately call these guys um, and go to the ER. When I actually saw the doctor, they explained to me what I've encountered, and to the point where when I was calling them, I couldn't speak because my speech was slurred as well. I was like, oh my, I'm like in my 20s, I already have these kind of issues. That was bizarre. So the doctor basically said, oh, it's actually a panic attack. It's nothing more than that. It's not a stroke or heart attack yet. But if you're going to continue doing what you're doing right now, you will end up with a real issue. Not, not to say panic attack is not real. Panic attack is very real. Even though it was an unwanted experience and something that I won't wish on any of us, it was a great motivator because it was very beneficial in the sense that it helped me to change something about my daily routine. And when you talk about the motivators, there are a lot of them, but the four more important ones is, of course, the first one is a fear. More commonly is a fear of death. Often when people brush off with death or get close to it, or even if they feel like they're dying, similar to anxiety attacks or panic attacks, it really helps you to make changes in your life. Change of the purpose or having a purpose. Often for many people, it's the birth of their kids. Uh, or other purposes in life, or changing the family overall. So that really helps to motivate and change in your life. The religion, or the overall feeling of the community, whether you're religious or not, it ultimately all comes down to the fact that you're not lonely. You have someone to work with. You have someone to, you know, uh, who will care for you, or at least for you changing your life. Like if you go on the run, 
with a group of people, that's a community that will help you to change your life or improve it for the better. So, you know, imagine that we found one of these motivators to apply to us. What do we do next? And it's important to figure out the next steps. Of course, the first, pro first step in any sort of problem solving is to find what the problem is and identifying the problem. And that's why it's important to even understand whether stress is bad in the first place or not. And not all stress is bad. More, the reason why I can say that is because nature is smart. We won't have stress built in into us if it wasn't for a certain benefit or for a certain purpose. And the reason why I'm saying that is because the purposes of stress are fairly trivial. That common fight and flight response. If you think of, you know, a long time ago, we were like basically, you know, living in the jungle or like, you know, running for a, our prey, hunting. If you go through the jungle or through the forest and you encounter a predator or like, I don't know, cheetah or a puma or something, you have two choices, fly or flee. You know, you, have, you can either fight it or flee. And that's major stress for you to even make that decision. And if you weren't be able to make the decision quickly, because of the feeling of stress, we would have uh, never survived up to, up to this point. Sleep, we should, we should have been able to uh, have a sleep deprivation for a shorter period of time. Again, tracking our prey for a longer period for a couple of days might require you know, not to sleep whatsoever. And hunger, being able to stay hungry for a short period of time while still keep our cognitive abilities, or at least keep the goal in mind, again, if you're trying to hunt the prey, is important to be able to withstand as a humans. So, if stress makes sense, if nature is smart, why do we feel bad in the first place? What's the reason for that? Why wasn't it just removed from our genes, from our, you know, human sake. It's because there are two types of stress. There is an acute or short-term stress, and there's long-term uh, long stress. When it comes to do those two, the short-term is something we have to keep, while long-term is the one we have to avoid. Short will be something like going to sauna. You know, it's an acute, short um, heat wave that we have to endure. But the long term, that the continuous sleep deprivation, overwork that we have to endure is what end up um, with some health issues in the long run. It's that long term issues that we encounter. If you were eating junk food once or twice in the, in the month or like in a year, it's okay. But if you do it every day, it's that long term stress for your body is what we're going to try to avoid. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So the conclusion and what we will focus on is how to incorporate short term stress and eliminate the long-term stress. So, it's very easy to say that, but it's fairly complex to do that. Fortunately enough, there is a good old trick how to tackle any large problem, and the stress is a large problem. So, it's to divide and conquer. So we already know what the problem is, now we need to divide it into sections and try to tackle it one by one. So what are the grounds for stress? That will be our division. The grounds for stress are fairly common. Sleep. We all have to sleep. Nutrition, we all have to eat. Fitness, whether it's mental fitness or physical, it's a, again, it's an area where we can have stress and might need to eliminate some practices or improve some practices. And work is a major ground for stress as well. But let's be positive and call it a grounds for anti-stress. Or in other words, find that, uh, those grounds to be in areas where we can improve our lives and avoid stresses in the future. So. Let's go one by one. When it comes to sleep, why do we even need sleep? If you're questioning that, I really envy you. I would love to have a sleep right now, uh, especially because of time zone differences. So, the reasons for sleep. There are quite a few of them, apart from it being great. Uh, one of the first ones is that it's been proven that it really helps people avoiding depression. If you are sleep deprived by, this, by the very nature of stress, you will feel depressed. When it comes to the diseases, especially the major one, mental diseases like, uh, or, or syndromes like Alzheimer has been linked to a continued sleep deprivation, not just uh, to genetics, but in particular to the sleep deprivation. So it helps to avoid that as well by sleeping. It improves your creativity and also the memory. This whole phrase we have for, you know, sleep on it, sleep on the problem. It's actually real. If you sleep on the on a problem that you've encountered the day before, in the morning you might come up with new ideas. It's been, uh, when, you, when people study sleep, it has multiple stages. And one of the important stages of sleep is the, when we 
actually dream about the problem or come up with a new solutions, and it's very important for you. If you're still not convinced there is an awesome book, Why We Sleep, it's quite large. That being said, the audiobook is a quite nice uh, listen. I would say I highly recommend. Uh, Matthew Walker right now, I believe, uh, is a chief sleep officer at Google. That's an awesome title. Like, that's, that, that's just great. I wish I had one. But uh, he, he knows what he's talking about. And if you basically, whoever you are, if you're a business person, if you're a manager, an employee, a parent, he talks about all those areas and why sleep is important for those, for those people. Even though it's all great when it comes to sleep, it's good to know why we, uh, how we sleep. It's good to know why we sleep, but more importantly, and a good question to ask, how do we sleep so we have a healthy sleep at the end of the day? Because anyone, any of us can just you know, lay on this stage and have like an hour or just a quick, quick nap. Fortunately, it's not the way to go, even though naps are awesome. So, a path to healthy sleep. First and foremost, I really encourage people to have this isolation and removing the noise pollutions that we often um, encounter. If you're on a plane, make sure you have some protection for your ears. Uh, if you are, make sure you buy like a, a eye mask so you don't encounter those lights, especially the blue light. If we all using laptops, mobile, install something like a night shift or something that will dim the lights for you so before you go to bed, you're not encountering those uh, you know, sleep altering lights, the blue light as we call it. Um, try to control your environment. It's important to like things as simple as changing the sheets in your bed. It's actually been shown that if they are, haven't been changed for a while, which is often the case uh, for some, especially the students and such, uh, if you don't do that, you will actually, your sleep, the health of your sleep will be degraded as well. Uh, or try to strive for eight hours uninterrupted sleep. But that being said, life happens, so what's important is to establish the constant wake time. Even if you're not able to you know, have those eight hours, make sure you wake up at the same time, even on days off. That's what your body gonna get accustomed to, and you will feel much more fresh than if you were to sleep until noon. Even though it sounds amazing though, sleeping until noon. That's me, how I control my environment. I, it's, I'm being sleepy as well, but no child ever on a plane would disturb my sleep. I'm basically like, I'm like Hulk here. Nobody can ever penetrate my uh, defense here. So I basically have an awesome eye mask. It's called Polar Bear. Uh, I have a construction level earmuffs with the special application I connect to like ambient sound and I have an awesome pillow. So like when I'm there, nobody can even bother me whatsoever. So control your environment. If you want to learn more, this is a great book, Sleep by Nick Littlehales. The title alone, Sleep, won't help you much. Just look for the name of the author, Nick Littlehales. He's been a coach of uh, lots of uh, professional sports team like cycle team or national uh, soccer team. Uh, I believe he's based in the UK for the most part and that's where he has the majority of his work. So, that was a nice topic, sleep. When it comes to nutrition, this phrase, I, I, it was so hard to find who it is actually attributed to. I'm not going to even try to pronounce the name. But this whole idea of the statement people make, you are what you eat, is really, is actually true. And uh, if I were to give you general nutrition guidance, and I'm not a nutritionist, but those general things work for me and for m most people for that matter, is that diets don't work. The most common thing with diets is so-called yo-yo diet. It's been shown that majority of people who endure a diet, I believe in 15 years, over like 80% of them go back to the original weight and then some. Maybe it can be contributed to the aging process, but maybe to the fact that diets don't work for all of us the same way they work for, you know, like this like person A, it might not work the same way for person B. It's always all about the experimentation and making it work for you. It's all about the moderation. You shouldn't restrict yourself completely because it's a new fab and paleo and keto and no carbs. Keep it so it works for you and try out a couple different things. Maybe carnivore's diet is your choice or vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian. There's so many names for it. Don't even go by the name. Just figure out what works best. But honestly speaking, sugar is a horrible thing. I mean, it's tasty and sweet and I love it, but it's so tough though. Um, I'm being, of course, hypocritical, especially when it comes to speaker dinners and stuff or any sort of dinner. Um, like in Poland or here. That being said, sugars that I'm talking about are processed foods that people dump sugar anywhere. Like even if you buy yogurt today, 
It will have so much sugar, you have to avoid that, because that's going to give you a sugar rush in the day, you will feel tired, you, want to, you have to avoid that at all costs. I really try to improve how many greens you eat, how, many sal like how much salad you eat. It really helps. If you don't like salad, and I didn't like salad, I've just basically made the green smoothies. There, there's a thing called Magic Bullet, that basically it's a small mixer. It's great to get started with it, because it actually it's green, while it's still not a salad, so if you have that challenge, you can bypass it fairly easily. T telling you from my experience. But the major thing and the key to food control of any kind is the intermittent fasting. People have been talking about it a lot. I'm not going to talk about it to the point of, oh my God, I changed my life. The thing I will talk about is that, just to give you an insight and the way people talk about it, it's a simple model of basically, you not eat for 16 hours and you only eat within eight hours window. Or if it's an example, you basically you eat between noon and 8 p.m. or between like 1 o'clock and 9 p.m., whatever works for you, just work around your schedule. The reason, it's not because of, I'm not bringing it up because how much weight people lose or whatever works for them. The important thing is that you don't have this stuffed feeling anymore. If you eat breakfast, lunch, uh, dinner, and you basically continuously eating from starting from the morning all the way to the evening, you feel stuffed, you don't, feel, don't ever feel, feel hunger. You're missing out on that acute stress that I brought up at the beginning. And as humans, we have to go through this acute stress at some point to get our body rolling. And there's some longevity studies around it. I'm not going to speculate on that too much, because majority of them have been only done on mice. <laughs> uh, but that being said, it just from my experience, it's really helping you to control, and, uh, control what you eat. In terms of some podcasts around nutrition, and from actual nutritionists, Ben Greenfield is a great resource for any sort of information about health. Uh, Model Health Show, I'm not a fan of the name, sounds kind of pretentious. That being said, it's a great positive podcast to take a look at or listen to. And the Human Optimization Show is a similar kind of focus, nutrition, health, and such. I highly recommend those three, especially Ben Greenfield. That's my favorite. Um, even though you might have heard about all those things that I've said before, and the sleep and the nutrition stuff, and again, it might sound easy, but it's difficult in practice. And I've, many of us tried a couple of changes in our life, but we never actually stick to them. And the reason for that is because we often fight with our nature. Instead, we have to embrace it and work on top of it. That's where habits come into play. Habits are tricky. They are drivers of our daily routines. We do things the same way you know, software works. We have patterns in our lives. And we stick to them, and they, that's what controls our lives. So, the important thing to know is that all habits follow the same exact rules, or so-called habits loop. So, habits loop is fairly simple. You have a cue or a trigger, you have the routine or the thing that actually, the, the, the process, and then you have the reward of some sort, and it just keeps going. What's important, and if you want to work with your nature and just and work on top of it, is that you use the same cue, you have the same reward, you just replace the routine. An example, in the book I will recommend, just in a couple slides, there was a case. Um, there was a lady who was, bite, she was biting her nails, like, aggressively. Um, she had to go to the therapist because of that. She was aggressive biting nails. So she went to the therapist, and they uh, looked at the cue. The cue was she felt some itching in her nails. She beat them. To avoid, to, and the reward, uh, the eventual reward was she didn't feel itching in her hands anymore. So what they worked with the therapist on is they replaced the biting part by she just started sitting on the nails on her hands every time she felt itching in her, uh, in her fingers. So basically the cue, itching, stayed the same. R routine was replaced by sitting on the fingers, and the reward stayed the same. The itching would go away. So she, they worked on it, and it improved her livelihood like in a couple falls. Like she, the account that she gave as a result of this uh, treatment was amazing and really heart, heartwarming. And, uh, you know, I've settled quite a bit, so even at this point, about this whole habit stuff. And if you're ready for a change, might seem seems like a lot. What's important is the keystone habits. You don't have to do everything I bring up today. If you at least can find one thing of any of the sections I've mentioned, they might change or trigger you to do other improvements in your life. And it's because of the point of keystone habits. Keystone habits are things that if you stick to them, 
they will change your overall behavior in other areas. And basically, those idea of small wins that will have ripple effect in other areas of your life. If you go for a run in the morning, for example, you will have a different perspective for the entirety of your day because you feel like I've accomplished something. I've done something that's difficult. I feel like a winner. And that's something our people these days are missing. They, they question themselves. They don't feel like they've achieved anything, even though they've done a lot throughout the day. But the fact that they've done something as somewhat difficult, like running or exercising or doing meditating in the morning, helps them to feel in this winner effect, and winner feeling. The Michael Phelps, famous swimmer, by the time he goes on the, you know, on about um, swim his lanes, he already achieved many wins. The music, the, the playlist he prepared was exactly as he wanted, exactly as he set it up. You know, the, the clothes he prepared the day before for the gym was already there. It's the small wins that count. If you want to learn more, this is an awesome book, The Power of Habit. Available on Audible. Audible is great. I love those audiobooks. So, when it comes to fitness, fitness is a huge point, uh, a huge area as well. What's important with fitness is not just physical, it's also mental, mental fitness. So, let's look at the physical one for a second. It's a highly, it's a very frequent keystone habit when it comes to, as I've said, just going for a run. It's important, it really acts as a trigger for other areas of your life. It requires variations. Things like you don't just go to the gym and do workouts and do the weights every day. You have to have some acute stressors, changes. Do some yoga, do some variations. Don't go for a jog, but not every day. Go do some cycling. Have that in place. You have to integrate it in your workplace. If you commute, have an active commute of some sort. Go for a bike ride, go for a run. These days, many offices even have gyms pre-installed in their um, their area, or you go to the gym uh, near your workplace and take a shower there, but just have this integration of the somewhat active commute of active uh, workout while still living your regular, like, daily life. And really have a flexibility. Don't just focus on one area of your you know, uh, gym routine. Have the morning routine of some sort. Do some like, small exercises before you go on with your day, before you go to work. It might be half an hour, 10 minutes, uh, especially these days, is the high-intensity training has been quite popular. Uh, if you travel, always work out. Travel a lot. I go for a run every, every country I go to. It's one of the most essential things. It helps you with all parts of your life, jet lag, everything. You have to do that. Otherwise, uh, it, you would not uh, feel well. Uh, gamification when it comes to fitness, physical fitness is important and very beneficial. Strava is a great app. If you go for runs, hikes, walks, biking uh, trips, Strava, you can find me there as well, we can connect. Uh, I need some friends there, nobody. Uh, um, my zone tracker is more expensive, that being said, it's uh, just the whole point of having variables. Um, I'm not a huge fan of variables, like going to the point of like taking shower with them and sleeping with variable. If you want to track your sleep, there are nice, like there is an aura ring for tracking sleep. But when it comes to the exercises, physical exercises, variables are awesome. Because you can actually, because again, it's the idea that, oh, I've done 10,000 steps today. It gives you sometimes that small, like, beeping sound. Yeah, we you got something. It's just, again, a small wing is important for you. Really try to have that in your life. We need small wings in our lives. Life is tough. Uh, mental fitness, when it comes to mental fitness, that one is not any less important than the physical one. I don't want to use, I don't like using the word mindfulness because it's been so popularized and just mainstream. That being said, it's a simple concept that I've only been able to appreciate after I've, uh, as much as I've read about it and definitions that they say, it's all about being in the moment. It might sound like trivial, what the heck does it mean? The point I was able to understand what it means exactly is, I was going for a run, I was just finishing my miles, and I was so tired and had no water, nothing, so I felt kind of exhausted. And I was listening to the, was it the podcast or audiobook where they basically redefined the mindfulness once more, saying being in the moment. Because I was so tired, I was able to, you know, remove all those distractions, all those people, everyone who I, because I was running outside, everyone, and I was just enjoying the, you know, the nature around me, the, you know, because I often run near the seawall in Vancouver. And that was just an amazing feeling, and I realized what this actually means, what mindfulness actually means. It's all about the clearing your mind, removing all this clutter, and it's important. 
Controlling your emotions is just, I can't overstate how important it is for our daily lives. You have to embrace solitude, and I'll talk about it in a second, and you need to incorporate meditation to some extent. If I were to talk about mind, we all, to these days, are information overload. Just look at how many t talks we have at this conference. This conference has quite a focused uh, base. That being said, if you go to some events, they would have 10 uh, different tracks, three days or five days event. Even that is information overload, potentially. Or if you read the news or articles on Hacker News or Hubber or whatever app you might be using. So much information, so hard to work with that. You have to remove this overload and keep it focused. If you, ha you have to have this, remove this information dump from your life. Instead, just have this source of truth, single source of truth. If you have uh, all those articles running around, have a single place you save them in. You know, bookmark them only in a single place. Don't have it all over your house or all over your mobile phone or desktop. Have it in a single location. Evernote may be a good choice. You can save your notes in there. Don't have it in 10 notes apps. It's just going to give you more stress. Because now you stress that you're checking your one app, maybe another one has another item to do. You don't want to stress about things that help you with stress. Because you want to keep a single focus. That's the only way to progress. And if you want to learn more, this is a great book about keeping your mind clear. Uh, also available on Audible. It's a nice book. It's uh, been a New York bestseller. He's writing another one about hope. I highly recommend. Controlling your, your emotions. I cannot overstate how important that is. Especially negative emotions. So this is uh, Jeremy Ashkenaz. He was enjoying the sun, uh, you know, about to swim in the water, and then he posted this picture. Jeremy Ashkenaz, by the way, is the guy behind CoffeeScript, Back, uh, Backbone.js, and lots of other cool things. So, someone left a very lovely comment. Uh, I'm not going to read the comment, but that being said, that's a very um, interesting uh, feedback you would give to someone who is enjoying the sun. So, whoever this person is, and I've kind of hid the person's name, you can still find it, the link is here, <laughs> is that don't, 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 it never justify to be rude for no reason whatsoever. It doesn't help anyone. Whoever is rude, they have other problems in their lives. The art of unsent letters, if you're angry with someone yourself, the, Abraham Lincoln, what he used to do, when he was angry with someone, he would write a letter, angry letter towards someone who actually, you know, did something wrong, or at least wrong from his perspective. But he would never send that letter. He would, you know, he would write multiple of those. If you're currently on your workplace, write the email, uh, negative email, but never send it. The important point to make, if you're writing an email, make sure the recipient bar is empty. <laughs> You don't want to send like, oh, let's send a reply all or something like that. You don't want to do that. Make sure it's empty or even do it off offline or some, I don't know, visual code. I usually write my angry letters there because I, I know it won't be sent. So make sure you do that. Uh, and it's good to focus on improvements or, you know, when the project ends, you think, how do I make it better? How do we make it better? Don't focus on that all the time. Sometimes talk about what was the success of the uh, project and try to celebrate those. Don't just, don't just think of how do we improve going forward. And uh, really give, be proactive with your feedback, especially when it comes to junior engineers or those who are entering even the public speaking area or whatever, your profession. I still remember to this day the things that architect told me when I was just getting started. It, it really changes their perspective. They will remember it forever. Even the small comment, you would be shocked how well people memorize those things and how much it makes a difference for them. And uh, unfortunately, when it comes to positive feedback, we don't get that proactively as much, but we're always open to give a negative, negative feedback. So keep that in mind. Uh, some talks on this topic I suggest. Brad Cannon, um, he gave a great uh, talk and a blog about kindness, uh, and uh, he had a podcast with Changelog. The episode is going to be linked in the slides as well, so you can look at it on your own time as well. It's a great podcast. Highly encourage you, you to explore. When it comes to the solitude, so here it's really for you to embrace yourself and know yourself. Because if you don't know about who you are, no one else would want to. That's why I encourage people to try things like flow, th flow therapy. It's basically this, um, it's the sensory deprivation tanks. It's when you lay in the darkness with no sound and salt water. It might sound like stressful to some, most people, I would say. But give it a try, or you know, go in a you know in the nature with no headphones, trying to enjoy, enjoy that silence, and see for you know for yourself how lovely it can be without those you know noises around you. And uh, meditation. There are so many different types types of meditation. There is unguided meditation, active meditation, 
just give it a try. And if you need help to get started with that, um, I would recommend a couple of applications when it comes to meditations. There is a Headspace. They have, a lot, they have quite a few free ones before they start charging you, but they help you to at least learn how to meditate. Relaxed meditation is not an application, and the Calm is a fairly popular these days. They're really growing extensively as well. And there's a lot of free materials on all of those apps I've just mentioned. It's all about just learning how to do it, and it's fairly simple. As long as you do it consistently, it's all about consistency and moderation. And um, you're still skeptical of meditation, and it's good to be skeptical in life. This, there is a great book of 10% uh, 10, 10 Happier by Dan Harris. Uh, in, in terms of, he really highlights he's not religious in any way. That being said, he brings up how important meditation and what kind of difference it made for him. And, uh, you know, if you say you don't have those 10 minutes to meditate, Tony Robbins, a famous motivational speaker, says, if you don't have 10 minutes for yourself, you have no life. And that's like, I spent more time, you know, um, eating lunch or breakfast this morning because of, the, you know, more than 10 minutes. I could have found some time to meditate if I wanted to, and I did. So, let's go to the last most stressful area, work. <sighs> Main sources of work stress. Office environment, communication, distractions, and project plannings. Let's look at the first one. And by the way, this is a very trimmed version of the talk. There are many more stresses than that, unfortunately. But work stress is quite a tough problem to tackle. So, let's look at office and you. Open, open office is a nightmare. I, I can't overstate how, di how difficult it is to do any, get anything done. It really takes control, self-control a lot of time to be able to do it well. Office perks, all those like lunches or late, time, late night dinners, are ultimately not the perks, they're actually office bribes. They try to bribe you for your time and they say, oh yeah, you're going to get a free lunch but you'll have to work five more hours extra. You don't want to have that. It's a bribe because ultimately you're trading your life force, your life energy, for just count how much. It's not going to be worth it in the long run. There is a reason why we get to so much work done on a plane with no inter inter you know, interaction or distractions. That actually shows the problem with the above point, the open office. And always remember, work is just work. You are replaceable. Everyone is replaceable. There are very few people who cannot be replaced. And there is a thing that they say, you change, that saying, change organization, you, like, you either change an organization or organization, okay, sorry, change organization, change organization, or organization changes you. What I mean by that is, you either try to improve your environment, your workplace. If that doesn't work, best thing to do is to leave and change the company. Because if you don't do that, and you stay in the company you weren't able to change, they would change you in the worst way you will get corrupted yourself. I've seen it in the past. It never, uh, you know, it's never looked good. So uh, always be very conscious of where you're working and what you do. Consider remote work. This is a great resource to start with that. Because again, open office is a nightmare. Communication. When it comes to communication, these days we have um, way too much requests for a synchronous communication. Let's just have a 10 minutes call. Are you available for a call later tonight? Don't have those, you know, those type of communication. What you need to strive for is asynchronous communication. Because majority of the things can be done offline. There is a saying that the most favorite teammate you might ever have is a person who by the end of the horrible meeting would say something like, it could have been an email. Whoever does that would be the most favorite person. People often confuse instant reach time with those uh, Slack and the actually these days it's mostly Slack or Hangout, they think that instant reach time always means an instant response. It doesn't have to. If they can reach you instantly, it doesn't mean you have to reply instantly. So keep that in mind. But the more importantly, set expectations. If you set expectations and that you're not going to reply right away, but you will reply that day, especially if you work in different time zones, it will work out just fine. And always have names to faces. Never, if you work remote a lot, have the avatar ideally with their face, or have a webcam turned on every so often, so they can humanize you. As we get dehumanized more and more these days with all this messaging. When it comes to distractions, that's a major point, a major concern. We have mobile devices. It's important to acknowledge how we no control the noise, set boundaries, and more importantly, get in the zone. So, mobile devices. Before I used to have something like this, 
Lots of notification bubbles, it's very frustrating, it's horrible, it gives me anxiety just looking at this. So, now I have a somewhat, some people can say sociopathic kind of arrangement now. Everything is organized, no notification. This is a work phone, by the way. My work, like email and stuff, gets turned off after work hours, and it's important to do that. Arrange your apps, or maybe delete them, unnecessary ones especially. Disable all notifications, everything can wait. Do not disturb mode if you have like an iPhone or something. It should be always on, unless you like have an emergency that's waiting for you, but there are very few emergencies in life. We always call something an emergency or high priority, but it actually isn't. And put your phone away. It's, a, it's been shown and it actually works great. If I sit on my, you know, in front of my laptop, I take my phone and I put it farther than the length of my arm, I wouldn't actually make an extra step to step off my chair and grab it. Just put it you know, farther than your hand. It will make a huge difference. When it comes to noise control, it's really about having su no you know, sound support or noise canceling headphones and such. Setting up boundaries. Establish something called library rules, where people can only, if you have experts in your team, establish office hours, or time when if someone has a meeting, they go to the room and discuss it there in more details. And really, if you get in the zone, have the rules for that as well. People, let people ping you first on, on the Slack and only then have a talk with you. Don't just get those tip on the shoulder thing. It really gets you out of the zone really quickly. Some recommendation is the Brain FM is a great app for controlling noise and sounds. Spotify, obviously, some music. Um, and my noise is just a white noise that I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't get why people listen to that. It's too, in, it's too intense for me. Brain FM, though, is awesome, especially if you're flying a lot. So, some solutions for noise cancelling. Have an earplug, as simple as that. Earmuffs, the one I showed you, uh, I link it here as well. There is a thing called, there's an article called Poor Man Boss, where basically you can buy those uh, earmuffs, construction earmuffs, with the no, uh, music connected to them. And, uh, you know, some noise cancelling headphones if you wanted to have those as well. And the last part is the project planning. It's very stressful <laughs> to plan for a project because many people think that long hanging fruits are so easy to implement. Unfortunately, they are not. Primarily because people not often do dog fooding, or in other words, they don't know the project or the pro domain they're working in well enough to be able to just, you know, uh, just um, have a tool or product improved all of a sudden. So the long hanging fruits are actually fairly difficult to do. Parkinson's law. It's basically the idea that work will expand the more time you have. You have to keep that in mind and keep con take control over it. And the last part is this idea of the basically the Conway's law, where that your design of the software will really be affected by the design of your organization. So you have to start with your team and the organization you're working in before you make a change. It will affect the, the, your software. So you have to go start with your team before you make improvements to your software. And this is the last book I would recommend uh, for this how to deal with work stress overall. So we've covered quite a bit. We talked about sleep, nutrition, fitness, and work. And I've said before, if you can take at least one thing of any of these areas, it will highly improve your life. So I'll have to skip for the, of this point really quickly because of the time-wise. And this is the last book I want to recommend. More importantly, just call for action. Last thing I want to say, find the purpose that will help you to change your uh, practices in the daily life. Find the community that will, you can work with and uh, improve your daily routines. And more importantly, enjoy life. Life is not work, and I, ho I hope you know that or you will know that in the upcoming future. So with that, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here. I hope you learned something today.